Imagine a world where the rate of technological growth doubles every two years. As a result, economic activity doubles in tandem every five years, transforming the nature of work, industries, and education. But amidst this shocking reality, a startling truth emerges that 80 to 90 percent of all work will be augmented by some form of artificial intelligence in the coming few years. Now, while it's true that artificial intelligence will likely create around 100 million new jobs by 2025, it's unlikely or unknowable as to whether or not the next generation will have the skills needed to perform these jobs. So as an educator, my essential question is, how should we adequately prepare young people for a world like this, a world we ourselves don't completely understand? So the world is evolving at a rapid pace, and education as it exists doesn't adequately prepare young people for the challenges of tomorrow. The COVID-19 pandemic, as we're all aware, led to a drastic shift towards digitized work and learning, with 76% of all jobs incorporating some form of advanced IT into their platforms, whether or not that be artificial intelligence or blockchain, uh, advanced robotics or cloud-based tech, it is an inevitability. Furthermore, um, due to this exponential growth since the 1980s, jobs are being displaced faster than jobs are actually being created. Um, and as an educator, this is an unbelievably prevalent fact. Um, and just take communication alone. Um, right now, any student can instantaneously generate any written script in any dialect um, without any prior knowledge in that field through the help of innovative AI chatbots. Anything from competitive Hollywood movie script, to a fifth grader's math homework, to a graduate student's thesis work, to an algorithm that disrupts social behavior. Um, even a teacher can have it write its provocative TED talk on the importance of reformative education. Do you all truly trust that the story you're hearing now is my own and not one generated by ChatGPT? I mean, how would you know? Right? Um, traditional educational institutions as we know them do not adequately prepare students for the world if they still focus largely on standardized testing and memorization. Students are not taught to be risk takers and innovators. Rather, they're taught a very mechanical, rigid system that prepares a skilled but obedient workforce for the emerging industries of the day, in this case, the Industrial Revolution, and we're still using that today. Everybody in this room was once in school, and we all remember the curriculum that we learned. Um, and there are many outdated systems that we still use, and many of you probably have a sense of anxiety just thinking about them. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. One, um, there's only one right answer to every question the teacher gives you, right? That's an outdated system that does not foster creativity. Secondly, collaboration, which is a key I will return to, is often forbidden and off limits on major assessments. But in the assessment of life, collaboration is the only way to fix problems, right? Um, this is not a way to prepare students for the real world. Um, because of the decisions I made as a youth um, due to the death of a parent and ADHD, my academic and behavioral mistakes became permanent. Another major problem with education is that mistakes are not allowed to be corrected. Okay? Now, the decisions that students make within the walls of a school are often permanent and can impact the rest of a student's life. Right? That is not how you foster a sense of risk-taking in people. Mistakes are often a driver to success, and success is initiated by people who have the gumption to be able to do something new in the face of failure. Okay. So like I said, earlier in my life, I failed all the wrong exams, and I didn't have the maturity to understand why it mattered. So, barely graduating high school and college, I moved to Thailand as a backpacker. And I came into the field of education as it offered a means for me to do this. Um, however, I never actually saw myself as an educator at that time, as I mean it, use it as a means to travel. Um, and without any knowledge, experience, or certification in any way, I was tasked to teach world history and politics. Two classes I actually failed in high school. And to my own surprise, through experiential training and my own ambition, I actually thrived in doing this. Now, this experience would have a profound impact on my life. It's not only did it build an immense sense of confidence in who I was, but it helped me learn that young minds can accomplish anything 
through experiential training, like anything at all. Um, so I didn't see myself as an educator, actually, until I moved to South Africa after grad school with my new sense of confidence. And I worked in sustainable housing in one of the poorest communities in Africa. Um, once again, I had no knowledge, experience, or certification in construction or housing in any way. But I thrived at what I did. I learned the intricacies of sustainable housing. I learned how to franchise, micro-franchise. I learned how to formulate negotiations with stakeholders and investors and collaborators. And as an educator, I learned how to facilitate and pass on our housing modules to a young, ambitious group of entrepreneurs so they might make their communities a bit better. An aim to rebuild and help give hope to new communities through what we call C1, Do One, Teach One. Now, our housing initiative thrived and did very well until one fateful day a corrupt South African government came in and destroyed much of our housing franchises. My, many of you might not know, um, but housing is a very political issue in South Africa. Um, the government takes bribes in exchange for houses. Now, our aim was to empower everybody so that they could build their own houses sustainably. So, with investors and stakeholders bailing out out of fear, I returned to Thailand once again and became a certified educator, this time with a vision as to what experiential education is all about. And I also learned concretely that if you empower students with skills-based thinking, they can learn anything through experience. And I mean anything. And my own life story is a testament to that. So, um, returning to Thailand, I remember I was actually teaching my students about, oddly enough, the Industrial Revolution. Um, and I looked around the room, sort of like this, and I realized that the young people that I was teaching are even more like ambitious, more creative, more thoughtful, and more passionate than most of the adults I've ever worked with in my life. And yet these kids are the ones sitting in these uncomfortable chairs, wearing silly school uniforms, being forced to memorize material that most of them will never use. How many of you remember uh, much of anything from your high school years, from politics class? I'm a teacher, I won't judge you. Probably a lot, right? So I wonder why learning. I mean, it's important to know, but there might be a skills-based approach to all of this through experience. So I had an idea, what if I were to truly empower the class with a passion, with a focal idea? And that idea I chose was single-use plastics, an issue that's important to Thailand, but also one that involves all stakeholders because we all use single-use plastics, and so does the government. They have all kinds of initiatives about this. Now, this initiative would not involve any standardized tests, no universal right or wrong answers, just risk-taking and ambition. That was the plan. So, um, I, once again, with no experience, never built an NGO before, never led a team of people before, knew nothing about sustainability really, I took a risk and recruited a young group of ambitious students to try to solve this problem. Now, we had no connections or qualifications in any way, but we knew we needed to collaborate once again to solve this issue, to bring together people to help teach our students. So one way to garner attention is we came up with the idea of the single-use bag monster. Um, it's a representation that shows 700 single-use plastic bags, which is how much the average person uses in three months. Then, okay, how can we use this? We started our first initiative, which was on 2018 Earth Day. We decided with our new plastic bag monster, we would march down the entirety of Superfit and along the way interact with thousands of people, educate them about the issue at hand from a student perspective. We built the website and a petition, and we interacted with as many people as we could, showing our uh, provocative, aggressive signs to bring awareness to the issue. And what happened was phenomenal. We never had any idea of the impact that something so simple but so powerful would be. So, uh, shortly after that, dozens of international schools got a hold of us um, for us to teach their students about the power of student-led initiatives and teach their kids about environmental sustainability. Dozens of international news organizations from around the world called to reach out to us to interview about our story. What was it all about? Why were we doing this? What was the idea of a student-led sustainability initiative in Thailand? They'd never seen anything like it before. 
Now imagine most students, they get their work put up in a classroom, but our kids were getting published in international news outlets and meeting with important people and sharing their stories to real risk takers outside the walls of the school. Um, the United Nations and other organizations that have annual conferences and initiatives, and they invite us every year to participate in this. And these are some of our members who have given keynotes at um, these initiatives, and one of them is actually in the audience here today. Um, but yes, we have many people in our organization who work to achieve some of these goals. And like I mentioned repeatedly here, the key is collaboration. Without it, we're nothing. Um, and to me, well, you might see these organizations and see what they are, professional organizations that specialize in environmental issues and government awareness. When I see groups like this, I see teachers. I see people who have unique knowledge that students will never gain from sitting in a classroom. In order for the information of these people to reach young people, it has to be through collaboration and facilitation. That's what my job is. And we still work with many of these organizations today. Muhammad Yunus, Nobel Prize winner, also invited us to collaborate in his microfinance uh, committee that he hosts every year as his youth ambassadors. And one of the premier reasons we started, as I mentioned, was single-use plastics. Uh, we wanted to not only get them banned, but reform the culture as much as possible. And in many ways, we succeeded. It's definitely an entrenched idea in countries around the world. But the progress we have made is largely in part to collaboration, teaching kids, teaching kids not be afraid to interact with new people and engage in unfamiliar situations. Um, today, all of what you saw eventually led to the creation of what we call Green Green International, which is the first student-led social enterprise. And it's an internationally recognized organization that today we operate in four countries um, with various environmental callings specific to the countries we work in. Um, from responsible consumption to renewable forms of energy, so far you know, we use plastics, um, life below the oceans, and so on. And we did our first climate strike, actually our first two climate strikes, a year before Greta Thunberg was even a household name. And that's something we're very proud of because this is all student ambition. Now, one of the reasons as an educator I do what I do is because I am fulfilled when I see students with a formerly blank slate evolve to become leaders and passionate doers and pass on their knowledge to another group of ambitious students. Um, one story that really tells that story, an example that really tells that story, is, you might remember this, on, um, a few years ago, the government closed schools for a few extra days because the air pollution was so bad. Maybe some of you remember that. I see some heads nodding. Um, this was an incredibly important event because not only did it give kids a four-day weekend, I'm sure you can imagine, what, do you, what would you have done if the loudspeakers come on the government four-day weekend? Many kids were celebrating. We could hear them in the halls. But some of our members came to my office and they said, why is everybody celebrating in the hallways when we can't go to school? It's not because it's a holiday. It's because we can't breathe the air. And they said, why don't you do something about this? And I said, it's a brilliant idea. What do you think? At this point, I completely stood back and I wanted to see what did they actually do without my facilitation. Once again, the idea of see one, do one, teach one. What do you got? And the students said, why don't we contact some of our collaborators in the news to help spread the message. We get a hold of some of our friends and partners at other schools and organizations and see if we can put something together and maybe protest at CP headquarters. Simple enough. And they did that. And this is a picture uh, from the Bangkok Post that shows the entire thing. And that's not me in the Bank Monster costume. It's one of the students who willingly did it after they saw me do it the first time. Um, so when I see this picture, to me, this entirety is a skills-based lesson. It involves initiative, finding opportunity, collaboration, risk-taking, and creativity. All of this is something you can't learn in the classroom. It's something that must be done through experience. Okay? Um, so as I mentioned before, this is all see one, do one, teach one. And in my view, there can be no success without a successor. And these kids are succeeding. So, for eons, technologies like the bow and arrow, gunpowder, the humble nail, and the compass were the focal points of technology for thousands of years. 
hundreds of generations were molded into these forms of technology as they shaped civilizations over thousands of years. Today, no educator can accurately predict or prepare their students for a world that now sees thousands of years of technological progress each decade. Um, we must all collectively work to empower students to be the change makers and the innovators the world needs them to be. And Green Green International, to me, doesn't just involve educators, but it involves everybody to tap into the potential of life dormant inside all students that are sitting through classrooms around the world. Um, empowering students to be the change makers the world needs them to be. A vision to see one, do one, and teach one.